All right, in three, two. All right, go. every. Oh, mother. <laughs> 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 Off to a hot start. Um, all right, everybody, welcome to the return of the Average Joe's podcast. I am joined by Dylan Greer of OSU, Colby Bryceland of Akron, and Hunter Ford of VCU, and the president of the league. And I'm Wes Peters, UC's head coach. Um, say hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Thank you for introducing us very slowly, Wes. I, saw, I told you earlier, we're off to a hot start. I had to slow it down. Um, so anyway, <laughs> quick time for me to plug. Um, we're going to be looking at rebranding the Average Joe's podcast. So if you guys listening uh, have any cool names or ideas for rebranding it, please let us know. We are very open to suggestions at this point in time. With that being said, how do you guys feel about the season so far? Uh, we've had a few tournaments so far with the Buckeye opener, Virginia Classic, Towson Invitational, and this past weekend, the pink out. What do you guys think of the return of dodgeball? I am more excited for this season, I think, than any other one in the past. I think just because we've really been waiting so long for this. I need more content. Mm -hmm. The content that we're putting out is coming, coming way too slow. I want to see some Michigan teams play. I want to see more teams in the East Coast get in. Ohio and our region that still has not made an appearance. There's a lot of stuff that still has to be, uh, you know, unraveled. And I want to see it. I want to see it quick. Mm -hmm. I'm in a great total agreement there. Colby? Yeah, I mean, um, normally it seems like we've had a couple more tournaments at this time. Even sometimes we have, like, multiple tournaments in the same weekend. And that hasn't happened. Obviously, you know, teams are restricted. Rosters are depleted and growing, you know, back to the way they were. But, yeah, I'd like to see more people travel outside of their regions and, you know, get out of their comfort zone a bit. Yeah, I think it's going to take some time, like you said, with some teams not even be able to, to travel yet. Not, some teams not even be able to host. Like, I know Michigan State and GV can't host, so that's why they haven't played. We haven't even heard from a couple teams, really how they're doing at the moment but uh i think things will ramp up as we get into spring though there should hopefully be more restrictions lifted and hopefully we'll see more dodgeball hunter what about you well like i said before the season started uh it's about damn time um yeah that's right i'll echo everybody else's points without going too crazy but i'm excited for things that have come back way more excited to see the things that are becoming forward Absolutely. Speaking of things that have come back, uh, let's jump right into some reviews of tournaments. Um, the first one of the year was the Buckeye opener on September 19th, which featured UC, OSU, and Akron, as well as OSU's B team. Uh, at that tournament, UC, uh, counting the B team matches, which got scored kind of as forfeits, um, but you know they still played. UC went 3-0, and Akron went 1-1, one and, one, and I'm sorry, OSU went one and one and Akron went one and two. Uh, what do you guys take from that one? Um, there's a lot to take away, really. I think that Akron and, and my team, OSU, both, both showed, uh, honestly, like a lot of improvement throughout the tournament. The first match in comparison to the next couple that they played in, um, each team improved a lot. It doesn't really say much uh, Akron going into the UC game going one or losing one to five, but mm -hmm. still you could tell the team cohesion kind of was gaining a lot really quick. And honestly, it was just because that tournament was so early. These teams hasn't, haven't had that much time to practice. Um, UC had the advantage there for sure, because you guys are yeah. pretty much returning an entire team, but uh, OSU's team and Akron's team has at least half new players. So it was really a learning experience for them. And I think that that level of improvement over that short, short period of time is really promising for those teams going forward. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, it going in, coming out of COVID, we're probably one of the most senior teams somehow, even though we going into it, we were just in our second year. But um, now we're the big dogs, I guess, for lack of a better word. So to your point of both your guys' teams being half brand new, uh, it was tough for you guys to hang with our pace. I think it was just your new guys for the most part being like just this, their first sight of like real dodgeball and the semester's really only 
was it three four weeks old mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it had to be a like a complete rush for those kids yeah kind of continuing on the point there what do you think it says about the league skill as a whole if you see really is only coming into their second year as a team and now they're kind of the top dogs of the league because they have that experience but that experience right. only is you know two years of working together what do you think yeah. that says about the overall league and all the other teams that are putting together these new rosters uh, i mean a lot of teams are taking a step back it's it's very apparent uh jmu and towson on the east coast we'll get to them soon they're still good um they're returning a lot of people but yeah, overall, like Miami struggled, Ohio, I expect to struggle. Um, a lot of the big mainstays of the league are going to really struggle coming out of the gate once the rest of these teams start playing some matches, I think. And the overall quality is definitely down, but I think within a year to two years tops, I think the league will be back to where it was pre-COVID. Yeah, there's... ...far... Um... Like Colby, that first you, tournament, Colby, Colby, Colby. Yeah, can you re can you repeat that? You uh, froze. Yeah, there's something to be said about the quality of tournaments we've seen so far and the quality of matches. Mm -hmm. um, the first tournament was kind of like a shock to I think OSU and Akron. I mean, like you said, Cincinnati's pace was just like un unreal, and it just caught them both by surprise. I think. Um, Coming out of it, though, I think it really helped both teams to really understand how it's going to be this year. Obviously, teams aren't going to be as good as Cincinnati, um, or not every team, I mean, but uh, there are going to be a, a lot of, like, you know, top-tier teams and then severe drop-off from not playing and practicing. And, um, you know, as we get deeper into the season, their rankings will even out, and it'll make more sense right now. shifts in you know ranking but you know i believe uc will probably keep you know stay at the top for a long time um and akron and osu will probably be you know top 10 mid to upper tier the rest of the season but a lot of teams just question marks there yeah you were mentioning the um you cut out there again you're mentioning the actual rankings right and how they're all pretty even so teams are fluctuating a lot or was yeah that there's a lot of yeah, there's yeah. a lot of parity because of how close all the teams were in the rankings at the start of the season. Yeah. How long do you think it's going to take for those rankings to really even out to where they're supposed to be towards the end of the season? Because right now, I, I definitely think that there's a lot of teams who are not where they should be in the rankings. And I think there's, there's a lot of teams that, you know, have yet to play. So they're going to just stay in their, in their old position until things happen. I think it could be day one, day one of nationals until then, honestly. Hunter, on that note, you're, you know, president of the league, you know the most about how kind of the reset uh, works. Can you kind of explain it for everyone why sort of you're seeing Akron at the first tournament fall down after going 0 and, or 1 and 2, like 17 spots, and then after going 3 and 0, jumping right back up, basically the same amount of spots? Yeah, sure. So basically, just to kind of give the most high level view of how the standing system works, uh, it's a power rating system based off of what is what is more commonly known as ELO rankings, um, which I don't want to go full too, too, too full detail into that. But if you want to look up 538, they have a really great explanation on their website. But basically, you play against high level competition, you and you win, you gain more points. And then vice versa, you know, how, that's an exchange system that's created. And so for Akron, which came into the year at, you know, relatively like um, relatively higher ranking and then ultimately going one and two within the first tournament, uh, they, as a result of that, basically had, you know, losses that otherwise would be considered upsets uh, for the most part as compared to like a, against a team like Cincinnati, as an example. Um, however, you know, that works basically conversely as well, when as a result of that large drop that they had after this past tournament at the pink out, they got a really huge boost going 3-0, and beating teams like BGSU, um, along with uh, Cleveland State and Miami, you know, teams that they, you know, essentially fell behind. And so then now they have a situation where they got a lot of quality wins. And so we're going to see a lot of these, you know, kind of big shifts back and forth, um, especially just because, uh, to you guys' points earlier, 
we don't necessarily know where everybody is uh, skill wise. We don't have an established hierarchy like we did, you know, pre COVID. And so, um, you know, teams are going to start to feel each other out to the point about where I feel like things are going to even out and we'll start to get a better idea. I actually think it's sort of going to be region by region dependent. Um, this upcoming weekend, uh, especially, and we're going to talk about in previews, but Maryland's hosting a tournament with a lot of East Coast teams. And I feel like usually by the third tournament is a good indicator of kind of where, you know, uh, the standings are going to be within your respective regions. And then also I know Ohio is hosting down the road as well. So um, I think that we'll realistically actually find out sooner rather than later as far as like who our actual contenders are and who our pretenders are. It's really hard to determine the skill level between teams um, as a league without teams traveling to each respective region. I think that figuring out the skill level within regions is is going to be, you know, easily determined quickly in the season. I think I already know now a good idea of, of how the East Coast stands. And similarly with the Ohio region, um, lack thereof, you know, Ohio's presence and Kent's presence, but I still think I can kind of put it all down together, but it, in order to figure out, you know, how the real power rankings are going to be or where we expect to see teams on Sunday nationals, I think there's going to be, have to be a lot more travel between regions because we don't really see that often throughout the season because, you know, a lot of teams are busy with school because obviously they're, they're in uh, university getting degrees, so they don't really want to travel that far. So it's really hard for teams like UWP and UNL to get, you know, out of region experience. So putting them in a predictive standing is really difficult, you know, without teams being able to play them as often as some of the teams in Ohio, for example, that are pretty centered and, and can play other teams from other regions very often. Yeah, I think it's going to take some time, basically, like you guys said, just to see things shake out. I think we've got some differing opinions on how long that that's going to take. Colby saying nationals, Hunter saying another two, three tournaments, but, um, to, to Dylan's point, you know, the first tournament with UC, we were clearly the best team there by a mile, but that's because we had so much experience. So as more teams continue to develop their, what we seem to see a lot of big rookie classes, I think, you know, what we see, what we've seen so far at the beginning of the semester might not look like, look necessarily the same by March, you know, or February even. So, yeah, um, I kind of like the, um, the thought of rookie classes there. I'm going to kind of expand on that. Sure. Remember that these rookie classes are not just the incoming freshmen, they're, but they're also the sophomores last year since we didn't have a season. So there's actually a lot of people on our team or a couple actually who are sophomores, but, you know, it's really hard to see them as anything but rookies because that's what yeah. they are. But um, you're, you're gonna, we're going to see a lot of bigger rookie classes this year. And I think that the, the rookie list at the end of the year is going to be really a dogfight to the end to see which ones come out on top because there are a lot of people to choose from and there are a lot of people making names for themselves really early on. Absolutely. Um, so speaking of East, we've talked a little bit about the East coast. Um, let's get off the Buckeye, Buckeye opener. Uh, we'll see those two, two of those three teams again soon. Uh, the Virginia classic happened October 3rd. Uh, Jamie, you went two and oh, UVA went one and one VCU went zero and two. Uh, Jamie looked great right out the gate, kind of dominated both matches there. Um, VCU not being able to bring a full eight. Um, and I've heard a lot of comparisons for UVA being this being the best UVA team in history so far. So, uh, what do you guys think about that one? Yeah. Um, in terms of, you know, just kind of evaluating those teams, I mean, JMU has literally from day one always been one of the most talented teams in the league. I mean, you know, Wes, you were basically there right at the start of JMU, as old as you are, just messing with oh, thank you. Thank you. But yeah, JMU has always had, you know, uh, had a myriad of talented players. And, you know, this year seems to be no different in terms of just sheer athleticism, throw power, you know, all the above. So, you know, at the very first tournament of the year, uh, when basically no teams have any experience whatsoever, talent is going to shine a lot more. And that's basically what happened there. Um, with UVA, though, I will say that I was pleasantly surprised with um, the level of talent that they had as well. Uh, the real big returner for them, who's their captain, Jake Corman, 
Um, you know, no surprise that, you know, he's been a stud. He was, you know, a stud uh, the past couple of years as well, pre-COVID. Um, but there were some, you know, other players that uh, played really well that I was impressed with. Um, I thought Nick Wells and Ben Kelly in particular, you know, showed really strong uh, growth as well, uh, just in the first tournament of the year. And then additionally going into um, the past uh, tournament that they went to at Towson as well. So, you know, there were some good, some good things to see there from UVA. Um, with VCU, it certainly was disappointing that they were not able to bring a full roster, uh, you know, just kind of keeping in touch with the team. I know for a fact that they have about 14 people in their club, just kind of was a tough weekend getting people out there. And, you know, kids can be flaky sometimes, but ultimately, you know, we really hope that they're going to be able to write the ship. I think, um, you know, like I said beforehand, really JMU's talent is going to do them a lot of wonders early on, but uh, where I'll kind of segue into the Towson Invitational and kind of some of the struggles that, you know, happened there. Um, where I think that that runs into a little bit of a pitfall is when you either meet another team that's just as talented as you or you run into a team that's just a lot smarter than you. Um, you know, not to say that JMU isn't capable of being able to be a top tier team, but Towson, you know, is just as talented as JMU is, and they are also a lot better coached. Uh, Penn State, as we, you know, got a chance to see this uh, from the Towson Invitational as well, they are, you know, they are just as talented, potentially even more so um, to an extent. Obviously, we'll have to see more and more tournaments to see how, um, you know, they fare out and whether or not this was a flash in the pan. But, you know, ultimately, those two losses hit JMU pretty hard. But, um, we should be able to see them bounce back. And then, you know, I talked beforehand about UVA kind of surprising me a little bit, and that's how they were able to get their first win over Maryland, um, which is a really big deal for them. Um, so, you know, all, all in all, I think that one of the other things that's going to separate a lot of teams early on is the coaching that's put into them. So, you know, to that point with the Buckeye opener, yes, uh, Cincinnati is one of the more, you know, senior teams, so to speak, but also they have a really great coach over there, not to, you know. They have a mediocre coach. <laughs> not to hype you up too much, but they have hey, a really great guys, coach over there. Brad, Towson is being Brad coached Nagel by Colin Spore. <laughs> Towson's being coached by Colin Spore, who's, you know, he was obviously an excellent player when he was playing there, and no doubt that he, you know, is able to implement his strategy really, really, really well. And then Akron obviously gets a lot of really good alumni support from, you know, a lot of their more recent alums too. And so the more of that influence that you see from kind of the, not only like senior members currently on the team, but previous members kind of giving back to their alma maters, um, those teams are getting a lot of success early on. And, you know, I don't think that's necessarily a surprise, but, you know, it's something that a lot of teams should look to if they want to kind of take their game to the next level is finding, you know, a coach to help them out or teach them the ropes where, you know, they don't necessarily have that playing experience that they missed out on from the past two years. Yeah, I would like to say that alumni support and coaching from, you know, previous NCAA players is really where in any team gets their success ever. I couldn't imagine where Ohio State would be if they didn't have, you know, previous players that stuck around, you know, Jeff Starr, who played on our team for six years. He's one of our coaches and Felix Peroni who was the president of the league for however many years. He's he's also one of our coaches. So without having those two here to help us and kind of come to practices and give their alumni experience, this team wouldn't be uh, nearly as good as it as it is or has been in the past. And I think that on, on a similar note, it says a lot about the teams who are not doing well right now. I, I think that it, it's because their alumni aren't really showing up as much. Um, I can't really speak any specifics or any names because I, I don't really know the, the alumni history of some teams or where they're going after graduation. But, but I would hope to see teams like Ohio and, and Kent State do a lot better than they are right now. It seems like they're kind of having some recruiting struggles. They're not making their way to tournaments. I'm not sure if it's because, you know, there's no alumni kind of pushing that team going forward. But I think that, you know, seeing your team, your previous team do well is something that would, you know, push me to you know, kind of go out of my way to, to give them some support as an alumni. You see it in a lot of sports, like talent gets you so far, um, you know, athleticism, but it's really coaching that makes a difference. 
um, off the court preparation is, is huge. Um, especially like when you don't get to see every team, you know, play as often, you know, especially going from a two year break. Um, like, you know, Cincinnati coming off, they had just as much time to prepare as Akron and OSU did, but they were just so much more, you know, aware and, you know, present because of the preparation they put in, you know, before the tournament and, like alumni support and recruiting is, you know, crucial for the future of the league because as teams start getting coaches and, you know, having coaches to stick around for a couple of mm-hmm. years. Um, I, I've, I've been the Akron's coach for, um, well, since 19. Uh, Wes has been UC's coach since their inception. Ohio State's had a coach for a long time. You see those programs doing well, and it's because of the support from uh oh. NCDA alum. Um you know, but yeah, yeah, no 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 doubt. Not sorry, Dylan. Um I mean to, to speak to my own experience, like you know, I started the club and everything, but uh I, I don't think we would be anywhere near not to toot my own horn here or anything, but in Dylan and Colby's point, the coaching really does make a difference with these like young teams because you see a lot of clubs like in the past few, you know prior to COVID obviously pop up in like uh, you know, they don't have like that senior leadership. They don't have someone to necessarily teach them the do's and don'ts, like the really intricate strategies. Like why do we go up the court? Why do we push up the court fast and then get back quick after we throw? Like you don't, you don't see a lot of that. So I think a lot of these teams go to tournaments and a get shell shocked and B get kind of stuck in these holding patterns just because they don't, they don't have someone critically thinking and teaching them the, the why to why we, you know, do things and how the game is played the way it is. So, you know, I obviously speaking from experience, I'm a huge advocate of having a coach if, if you don't have a ton of senior leadership on your team. So it would be really, really encouraging if we could get a lot more alumni involvement. Um, so it, it really is crucial to, to gaining traction and getting better quickly, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and same for the birth of a team. The birth of a team yeah. either requires a, a the good coaching skills of an NCDA alumni member or, you know, just true dedication from a team. I, I think that OU in their uh, incarnation kind of blew my mind when Caleb Arnold kind of stepped up and took that team and they went to the most matches out of anybody that year in the league and they were a brand new team. I, I don't know if that's I'm pretty sure they went to the most matches because they lost, I think, everything that year. Every but, single one, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, like, they got better so so fast. Yeah, and they ended up winning ODC in, in 2019. And just a few years after, well, actually, they won ODC, I think, their second or third year as a team as well, too. Um, yeah. And, and that was a really crazy stat for that team. And that was just true dedication from that team starting up. A lot of the like the um, the leaps you have from like a young team, like from like your first tournament to your second tournament, is is wiped away when you have like that experienced leadership because they can kind of like tell you what the potential pitfalls are and what to expect because they've done it so often, and so you you have that that jump sooner to where it's like normally a second semester jump for a lot of teams, but it may be a second or third tournament jump or even like having just a different point of view of somebody watching and not actively for what's, you know, going on. Um, it's, it's crucial for a lot of teams and it's why some teams are having more success than others. Yeah. To, to that point specifically and to, you know, I know we got deep into this coaching and experience uh, conversation, but to get back on track kind of about the pink out that that really speaks to what we've been talking about, like the results there uh, with Akron going three, you know, obviously being a more senior team and uh, another big recruiting class, but they went three, you know, they have coaching, they have the senior leadership, Bowling Green went two and one, you know, a decent amount of returners, but a lot of new people. And I don't know how much alumni involvement they have, but, you know, these teams like CSU and Miami, especially Miami, who lost just about everything aside from Anna Mullenbeck and Ellie, I'm going to butcher your name, Schieffer. Um, like two two people are, re- they're literally rebuilding Miami from scratch right now after that club uh, was like 
inches away from winning ODC like in 2019. And, you know, um, I, th I think that really does speak toward just the, the level of like alumni involvement and if you have senior leadership on the team. So, uh, you know, Colby, you were there. What, what, would, what did you see from your eyes? Um, I mean, you, you said it like Akron's leadership, like um, not only their, you know, the coaches, there were two coaches there, myself and Adam Pfeiffer, um, but like their, their captains, Clay um, Eggleston and, you know, um, the other captain, Brandon Snyder, have been there in the league for a couple of years now, and they just know what to expect. It's their home tournament. They knew they had to show up and it really, there weren't any close matches really, Um almost every match ended in like a two or more point deficit. And it just speaks to, you know, um, the love, the different tiers of talent that these teams, you know, showed. Um, Akron, obviously the top tier talent at that tournament, you know, the closest match was four to two. And the last point was scored, you know, when they took all their players out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously after that BG, they had some senior leadership, but then they had some standout rookies that played very well. And then um, Cleveland State had the, you know, the other tier of uh, veteran leadership. They had um, a coach there for a minute, um, uh, helped them out for the first couple matches. And then Miami with no senior leadership besides their active players, um, obviously at the, the bottom tier there. And what, what, you what you saw, you know, if you watch that stream was just a huge, huge, you know, dive in talent and, you know, um, and part of that goes back to the leadership and the preparation. I know Akron watched film before the tournament. I can't say the other three did. Um, and it just shows that, you know, you have to put in work, you know, outside of tournaments and practice. And Akron's been doing that. Um, and, you know, BG, I know that they have a lot of talented people, but you're going to have to get these rookies up to speed because, you know, your two veteran players can only do so much. You have to get everybody up to your, you know, the same level. And that's where you saw, um, you know, the matches that turned out the way they did is because Akron's level from their top to their bottom player was a lot closer than the other teams. Cause like, yeah, BG had Cole Wilson and um, Gabe Carrington, who are probably two of the best players in Ohio right now, but there was a severe drop off of talent after that. And the closer you can get to having a more solid and cohesive roster, the better you're going to be overall. Even if you don't have, you know, Akron may not have all Americans this year, but they have the least amount of uh, parity from top to bottom. Um, I also think a like lot of that, seen. I think a lot of that comes from coaching and strategy as well. I think yeah. that a team of, of average or even slightly below average players can beat a team with a couple of stars if they have good cohesive ability and strategy on the court. I think that a lot of that is kind of overlooked when it comes to the individual ability of players, because obviously everybody wants to see big plays happen and big hits and headshots, whatever, because that's what's fun to watch when it's being recorded. But I think a lot of the underrated teams are those that really just have the best strategy on the court. And that might mean that they don't have, you know, the greatest of players. Um, like, for example, OU in 2019, they, they did have a, a lot of stars, but really their success, in my opinion, came from their cohesive ability to, co to coordinate at all areas, areas of the court to kind of, you know, just work together and make sure that everybody was on the same page. And when you have that strategy, you don't necessarily need the, the top tier talent that some other teams rely on. Yeah. Um, another point about the, uh, the pink out tournament was that it was great to see these teams show up and um, you know, Miami, they came with 10, I believe uh, CSU came with a full roster. Um, BGSU came with a full, a full roster. They had 13 rookies show up for the tournament, which is awesome. Um, Akron obviously had a full roster because they were at home, but also with the roster sizes, the more subs, you know, you can get those lower players to the, you know, to their level faster. Um, and you're, you don't have to rely on, you know, your top tier players because you can let them get the reps and, you know, learn the game speed. And that showed with Akron having played earlier this season and the other two teams going into it, not having played in two years they were at game speed faster than the other three teams who attended, um, especially, you know, Miami who has, you know, 
a full new team and BGSU who had a full team of rookies um, and CSU who had to rebuild as well. But it was a fun tournament to watch. There were a lot of exciting points. It just, most of it went super lopsided one way or the other um, to the victor. Yeah, no, it, it's really encouraging to see a lot of these teams. I think, well, Miami was in the biggest hole for sure uh, from what I gather only bringing 10 but I, th I think they were missing it like three or four people as well but like cs or bgsu brought to your point a full 18 csu brought 14 miami 10 and akron brought 18 and i know you guys have a ton of new people um so it is really encouraging to see like these big rookie classes uh, and hopefully that continues as we go into the uh the john betters bobcat bonanza uh in two weeks when we see a couple of new teams that we haven't seen yet, like uh, Ohio BGSU, or sorry, GVSU, SVSU. Yeah. But before then, we got to touch on the uh, the Maryland Dodgeball Tournament on the 7th. Uh, so instead of uh, reviewing, we're going to start previewing. Uh, what do you guys expect to happen at this tournament? UMD will be there, obviously. Towson, Penn State, VCU, UVA. And uh, a surprise to me, West Virginia. They were, uh, during COVID, going through quite a bit of leadership pitfalls and almost uh, disbanded. So it'll be exciting to see how many they bring to the tournament. I'm going to make a bold prediction. I'm going to say that Penn State beats Towson. I, I think don't know that, if that's that bold. I don't, I, don't, I don't think so either. Looking at the last tournament, you know, Penn State played four matches and their last one was Towson and they only lost two to three. So Penn State, you know, having – Having have played the whole day, I'm sure that they were pretty tired for that last game. It doesn't seem like, like they lost that much, um, lost by that much. I, I wasn't there to watch the game, so I don't know how close that 2-3 really was. But in my opinion, if Penn State plays Towson in second or third round, I think Penn State would probably win. I don't disagree with that take at all. Hunter, what do you think? So... I think that it's certainly fair to have that opinion because, yeah, Penn State definitely jumped off the page uh, in a way bigger way than I think, not I think, than I know any of us expected. We all saw the predictions. Um, I certainly did not give, Rip. I certainly did not give a ton of love, but, you know, so be it. Um, but, you know, going to that point, I think that ultimately um, one thing that helps Towson out a ton when they're playing on their home court is they really know how to use the court well. And obviously what I'm referring to is like the, you know, kind of their wall ball style of play, um, which isn't present at Maryland. So, you know, that's certainly going to be something that they'll have to adjust to and, you know, figure out how to play without it. Um, but ultimately kind of for the points that I said previously uh, with regards to coaching, I think that ultimately, uh, I think that ultimately Towson's going to prevail because they play a little bit more. They play with, um, you know, a lot of discipline on the court. And so, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, one of the other things that I want to point out as far as, you know, game style and gameplay goes is uh, Towson does a really good job of controlling that neutral zone area. And one of the things that they do is they basically, you know, try to take advantage of good effective opening rushes. And then where most teams will typically go on the back pedal after throwing, they're very disciplined about kind of staying on the attack line. And basically what they do is they create a situation where no matter, uh, no matter what the other team throws at them, basically because they have all of that court space behind them, they're going to be guaranteed to be able to pick up that ball regardless. And so it helps them get ball control really early on and then whittle numbers down by making effective team throws. And so, you know, with Penn State, it's sort of the inverse of things where their team, you know, is, you know, relying really heavily on their athletes. And so they have a lot of really great throwers and that's certainly something that they can, you know, utilize a lot in games, but ultimately if they're going to be, you know, kind of playing into Towson's favor and giving up ball control quickly, I think that's something that Towson's going to be able to build up on. But, you know, I was obviously very wrong about Penn state before. So there's a good chance that I could be wrong again. Um, in terms of kind of looking at some of the other teams, though, uh, I think that ultimately Maryland is going to have a pretty big opportunity to bounce back. Um, you know, they're a team that has a couple of senior me members on their group as well, uh, which includes uh, Daniel Fernald, Daniel Fernald, and uh, Max Juan. 
and Bryce Bathurst as well, um, who she has, you know, a legitimate shot at becoming like the, uh, you know, women's MVP. And what I expect to see from them is they'll probably have a more full roster. Um, they'll obviously be very more well rested because they're going to be playing at home. And so I think that they can pull off some, you know, revenge. I think they can pull off a revenge win against UVA and then potentially uh, get an upset against VCU as well. But um, the team that you alluded to, Wes, that's going to be the most interesting to watch is going to be West Virginia for sure. Um, one of the things that was impressive about them pre-COVID is they were certainly one of the most athletic teams in the country. And yes. with this being their first tournament, along with what will effectively be VCU's first tournament, I think that that gives them a really good uh, opportunity to pull off an upset win there and basically kind of out athlete, you know, another team, uh, so to speak. But, um, you know, like I said, uh, like I keep saying beforehand, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, it's exciting because we, we don't know, like, I don't think we know anything about uh, West Virginia. Like those super athletic kids, for all we know, might not even be part of this club anymore. Like, who knows, right? Yeah. Um, Colby, Dylan, any thoughts on, on Maryland predictions other than uh, Dylan's bold take? Yeah, I've been I've been waiting on Penn State to kind of come into their own the last couple of seasons. It seems like they always have like the athlete, the athletic ability, but it's like the team like coordination and cohesion they're always missing. It's kind of like like they're like JMU light almost to where they always can recruit athletes. It's just other teams beat them because they have better um, a better game plan and better coordination. But with this Penn State team beating JMU, you know, this last weekend and having it, or the, not last weekend, the last tournament, and having a good showing, this could be the year where they're putting it all together. Maybe they just needed time, you know, to, to kind of get what their game plan is going to be and get coordinated. It's, it's really exciting to see them come in to their own, especially being a big school like Penn State. It's cool to see those teams do well because they're big market teams. And, you know, them, you know, taking as long as they did to get to a, a certain level, you know, just depends on if they can maintain that level. And if, like Hunter said earlier, if it's just a flash in a pan, that'd be pretty unfortunate, but I don't think it is. I think that, like Dylan said, they have a really good chance of beating Towson um, this weekend. Yeah, uh, so obviously PSU Towson's going to be the game of the day there to watch. Uh, I guess my bold, I'll take a bold take. Uh, I'll say West Virginia gets their first dub of the year. No offense, Hunter, on VCU. <laughs> I'm, I'm on Team West Virginia right now, I guess. Yeah, none taken. I'm just pumped that they've recovered so well from what I, I knew about them going into COVID. Um, Dylan, anything? Otherwise, we can go to the, the JBB. Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick comment about VCU. Hunter, how is that team doing? Have you spent that much time with them? I know that they struggled to bring a full roster to the Virginia Classic. I, I don't know if I should be worried about that team, you know, continuing here soon. I'm just hoping that they bring more players to the thousand or the, the Maryland tournament. I'm sorry. Um, You're good. Um, yeah, admittedly, I have not been able to, I have not even been able to attend a single practice just because of some other personal life stuff that's been happening, i.e. getting a new job and being on West Coast hours, which is really, really depressing. Don't recommend it. Um, but, uh, in general from, you know, kind of the things I've been hearing out of the VCU camp, it's sort of a similar state to kind of UVA in the sense that they feel very confident that this is one of their more athletic teams and that they have a lot of really, really good throwers relative to past years where VCU has traditionally been more of a catching team, but ultimately, you know, I think one thing that's going to hurt them a lot is the fact that they haven't really played a traditional match yet. And then, you know, where where will we see you know kind of the team cohesion compared to a lot of other schools that have played in you know not just one tournament but a couple tournaments as well and gotten you know in more of a group together with each other um you know so that's going to be a really big question mark but um you know if you know kind of like i said the stuff that i've heard coming out of the practice is true about them you know having a lot you know better throwers than they've had in the past then, you know, we could see, you know, an ultimate, you know, evolution for this team and going to a new level than, you know, they were previously able to go to before. Hey, man, if there's ever a year where there's going to be teams sneaking up and being sneaky good, it's it's this year, man. Now's the time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, tournament I'm the most pumped for, obviously, uh, for 
reasons. It is the John Betters Bobcat Bonanza second annual. We're going to ignore COVID, um, which is taking place on November 13th. Ohio, UC, GVSU, James Madison, Ohio State, Saginaw Valley, Bowling Green, and Miami will all be in attendance, all eight of those teams. Uh, so we've got some amazing matchups, you know, on, on paper, certainly, for this tournament. We've got uh, to start the day, OSU and Saginaw Valley, along with JMU That's... and Ohio State. Wait, I said that wrong, didn't I? UC and Grand Valley. I'm sorry. Yeah. James Madison and Ohio State. I don't know how I read that wrong. Uh, as, along with GVSU, JMU, and then UC, JMU are the biggest four in my mind. Um, how do you guys think things are going to shake out? I'm really excited for the UC Grand Valley match. I think that, you know, from what I saw from, from UC at our home tournament early on this year, if UC keeps their pace, it's going to be really hard to beat that team. And we haven't seen anything out of Grand Valley yet this year. So it's yep. going to be interesting to see, you know, really how, how Grand Valley has been over the break. I know that they were able to practice a lot during the, the off season last year. So I'm not sure if they've kept the talent that they're that we're so used to seeing from them or if, you know, things have changed and they have a lot to, to, to build on. So yep. that team and, you know, making their first appearance here is going to be very interesting to watch. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I've heard, you know, take this with a grain of salt. I could be being lied to here, of course, uh, and sandbags since we do a big matchup. Grand Valley has about 13 people uh, in the club right now, or at least practicing regularly um along with six rookies so that's you know seven returners um ben smart is one of them so that'll be a, a challenge because he is quite the the pesky guy on the court so uh but yeah i think if we can keep our pace we should be in good shape i honestly think we're one of the most um well we are the fastest team in the league in my opinion just uh, on pure athleticism and pace of play so i think it will be i think it'll be a good day for us i'm confident uh what other matches are you guys looking forward to or what teams i'm actually see? i'm more excited for um uc and jmu because it's a team of like mm -hmm. just two two athletic squads going at it it's going to come down to who has the the better strategy which mm -hmm. i'm fair i'm also really confident is cincinnati um i like watching i mean i've told you this west many a times i am so high on the Bearcats right now <laughs> watching them play at Ohio state, like, you know, uh, Corey, um, is just an amazing and fast player and just absolutely fearless. Um, ski, what's his f full name? Matt Rosinski. Matt Rosinski super, very much surprised me coming into the match. His, his throws, they're not, you know, fairly hard, but they're well-timed and they're perfectly placed hitting people in the back of their heels, you know, when they're in blocking positions. And obviously you have um, Brandon McGinn and um, Brett Liming. Is it Liming or Liming? Liming, yep. Liming. You know, having the, that leadership on the court. I don't know if anybody, you know, Grand Valley or JMU included can hang uh, with that team. And it's going to be really, really exciting to see the matchup against, uh, a, you know, a more top tier school um mm -hmm. at that tournament it's going to be very interesting i might even come watch and i'm not my squad is even going <laughs> you should colby uc is a very interesting team all the players that you mentioned are very good throwers and uh you know their team is really top heavy with throwers but strategy comes into play and they kind of piece everything together in my opinion um uc's best player is ryan engelman because he will make catches that you will never expect I've never really seen a player that is so eager to get catches on the court as that as as he is. A lot of times, you know, you have the strategy where you go up with two with two throwers and one will throw and the other one will block for them. Ryan goes up no ball and he his blocking yeah. is just catching. So somebody throws and you see Ryan in front of him and you're still scared to throw at them because even if you have an open shot, Ryan will position himself to get that ball in his hands. And I think that he might be one of the most underrated players in the league this year and Honestly, I think that will probably change as the as time goes on. Yeah, no, I think he'll be, you know, uh, a household name going forward. He really got the short end of the stick with not getting to go to nationals and getting that like 
national recognition and just everybody getting eyes on him. Um, he's also played at a couple of these hybrid tournaments uh, with us in the summer and then early fall. And he's turned a lot of, uh, you know, the alumni's heads as well, uh, just with his pure catching. So, but I, I think we have quite a few throwers. We all play with pace um, and discipline at the same time, right? We're not, not a team that's going to go up and throw a bunch of balls on one possession, right? We get up fast, throw, get back. Um, and I, I, like I said before, I, I like our chances not to give too much away about certain players on our team. More yeah. than you guys already have. <laughs> your, your strategy is like the best of both coming together because you have like the young, quick athletic types, but you also have, you know, the, like the discipline, like you said, and just like your, your kids just go and go and go but also they, they don't have, they're not reckless either. And that's at the perfect balance of what you need um, for like to have it, you know, that competitive um, squad. So. Oh, I'd say Corey's reckless, but he, it's controlled. Re- it's maybe a it's controlled just, reckless. Maybe it's chaos more than anything. The kid will, has yeah. no, I've never seen a kid with less fear in my life. He'll go up and like draw three or four throws on a possession. It is in, and they're all from like 20 feet and he won't get hit. It's insane. Um, but yeah. enough about my team, uh, moving yeah, on to, I, I do want to, I do want to talk in about OU Saginaw and, uh, yeah. Oh, well, we already talked about GV a little bit, but OU and Saginaw, two other teams we haven't seen so far this year. Uh, I don't know a whole ton about them. I know they both, well, OU returned a lower number of players, but I know Saginaw returned a, a decent amount of players. I hope they uh, have good showings at this tournament as well. I'm pretty excited for the BGSU and SVSU matchup. Mm -hmm. I don't really know much about the Saginaw team, but I know that statistically, you know, they're always a team to hang in there in the past and they have their up years and they have their down years. And we really don't know what that's going to be yet because they haven't made a showing. Um, I know that's, it seems like there's some complications in the the North region uh, with, with hosting tournaments um, based on school restrictions, but it's exciting to see them come out. And I think that the matchup with BG might be a good one. I, I think that it's either going to be really close or Saginaw honestly could blow them out of the water. Um, it's just going to be something that we'll know really after the first point, which direction that match is going to go. Yeah. Hopefully we can get uh, multiple uh, GoPros or cam- just cameras going so we can record more than one match at the same time because I think there are a lot of candidates for match of the day on the, on this, uh, on this schedule. I like agree. Way beyond the four that I initially met, uh, mentioned. Hunter, what are you excited for? Uh, I'm excited to have something to do that day. Uh, I'll say that much. <laughs> All right. Um, you coming out? No, I won't. I will unfortunately not, not be there, be there, but, um, I've got, uh, I've, let's just say I've got some other duties to take care of that weekend, but um, I will be sure to tune in for some of those games. Uh, I would say like in general, um, I want to see just kind of the state of GVSU as a team, mainly just because I'm curious to see if they, after this sort of, you know, quote unquote, great reset uh, that we've had, if they are still really the creme de la creme of the NCDA. And so, um, you know, certainly by no stretch do I think that they will be anything like a bottom tier team, but I don't, I want to see if they are kind of like the invincibles that we've, you know, known GB to be in the past. Um, You know, obviously uh, they've, you know, got Ben Smart coming back and Tyler Peach are both, you know, fantastic dodgeballers. But, you know, one of the things that's made GB GB is the fact that they effectively have every single person on that roster, even people on the bench would be in an overtime, be an overtime six player for other teams. And so I'm one of, you know, kind of see if GV is still at that level and, you know, get an idea of, you know, who's the unsung hero from, you know, that team. Um, So that'll be, you know, really exciting to see Uh, in terms of, you know, kind of other things as well, just in general, seeing sort of the Ohio versus Michigan, uh, matchup as well in terms of and when I say Ohio I mean like the Ohio region of teams versus the Michigan region of teams because you know for a long time within the NCDA's history you know that was kind of the you know insurmountable gap between the two but then you know pre-COVID 
it was almost a 50 50 deal between you know who was likely to win and you know that given matchup and so you know is this finally the time where the ohio teams kind of take the upper hand on you know their uh pals up north or not um you know that would be certainly something that'll be interesting to see and then ultimately um you know i think that Ohio and Miami are probably going to be kind of on the, sh on the get, draw the short stick on this tournament. Um, but ultimately, you know, I want to see will these matchups, not just within this tournament, uh, but kind of like going forward, will these matches help propel them going forward so that they'll be able to, you know, pick off some wins against, you know, other teams down the road and kind of like, you know, see how they grow from their experiences at this tournament. Any bold takes here, guys? Any uh, big predictions? Let me I mean, look at, uh, let me refresh myself with the schedule real quick. Uh, I think a bold one, I'll throw out a bold one. I think OSU goes undefeated. I will say that in my mind, that's not very bold. I'd say my <laughs> I mind. was going to say UC, but that's <laughs> way more not bold than Ohio State going undefeated. I expect is? I fully expect UC to go undefeated. I think you guys are going to have trouble with JMU, but it'll be a very good match, is what I think. I don't know how you guys are overlooking GV automatically. They, like I said, they could be lying to me. Maybe, but maybe Kevin Bailey came back and he's just, you know, not saying anything. <laughs> I think Colby, even with Kevin that... Bailey, UC is still going to take that dub. <laughs> Colby, do you think that UC has a better chance of beating GV, or do you think the OSU has a better chance of beating JMU? Um, I think from what I've seen, I think UC has a better chance of beating GV. Um, but I think the match between JMU and OSU is going to be um, not a, I'm not going to say a better match to watch, but a more competitive match is what I think, because you guys have the, um, like the structure, but they have the athleticism. It's like two, two different um, types of teams clashing to where like GV also has you know, organization, so does UC. So it's more of like, who's going to have the better athletes there. But with you guys, it's two different styles of teams clashing. And I'm really excited to see that. Yeah, I think one thing that uh, GV has always been good at, I kind of touched on this point earlier, talking about, you know, strategy versus raw talent of teams. And I think that GV has always had, you know, just outstanding talent, obviously within their roster. But I think that they're best at, really coordinating as a team and kind of perfecting their strategy. It's really different to play that team versus playing really any other team in the league in the past, because you go up and you can't really make a mistake against GV because they're going to be able to counter, be able to counter you in, in some fashion, you know, whether it's you make a absurd throw on, on the attack line or you're just transitioning too slow. GV is really good at, you know, perfecting where your faults are and kind of attacking you there. So that point, seeing that against, sorry, I, I, I was so deep in thought right there. Seeing seeing GV's ability to kind of adapt to a team is going to be really interesting to see how they do against UC because GV might, you know, pull out the flaws that we haven't seen from UC yet. You know, UC has only had that one tournament. So playing against a team like, like Grand Valley, who, you know, has all this experience from past years about how to play against these tougher teams, Maybe they adapt and they overcome and beat UC. So it's going to be interesting to see where they where they end up here. Yeah, to your point about capitalizing on, you know, slow play or mistakes or whatever, when it comes to like the top tier talent, it's who makes the less mis the, you know, the least amount of mistakes, but also how do you capitalize on your other team, your opponent's mistakes? And, you know, with you guys versus JMU, your style of play doesn't lend to as many mistakes as JMU's does, but then their athletic ability has, you know, them be able to pull out the crazy plays that, you know, the wild catches or, you know, that we've seen from JMU. Um, that's why I think that it's more of a, it's more of a bold take to say you guys will go undefeated than UC because um, like with you guys, you still are a young squad. You know, you have a couple of veteran guys, you, Sam Palumbo, you know, to name a few, but it's going to be whether or not you can keep your, your structure and not, you know, make mistakes. Whereas you see in GV, it's going to be, it's going to come down to who has the better athletes, I think, because with both those teams, the strategies are so, they played their strengths so well 
from what I've seen so far and how, you know, historically JV's played, GV's played, so. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with you. Okay. You I, go now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, if you guys remember, OU's gym is not a super wall ball gym, but it is absolutely a gym you can play wall ball in. So I think that's going to be a big determining factor of a lot of these these bigger matches like us versus JMU and OSU versus JMU. And well, really any of these matches, right? Any team can play wall ball, but. I believe it's one side has a better wall ball than the other side. It one side's glass, yeah. I think. The other yeah. the, the other side also has a basketball hoop that's like right on the edge of the court from what I remember, yeah. unless yeah. they move those. So. I think it depends on which gym we play in. There's, there's a gym that has three courts, two are regular, one has uh, the glass wall and the other has uh, a brick wall. Um, that, that's for two of the courts and the third court is that hockey rink that is a little awkward like a multi-purpose so, room yeah yeah I'm, I'm hoping we don't have any games on the on the hockey rink but if we do that would kind of change um, you know the outcome of those games quite heavily in my opinion also I, I would like to make uh, a comment about wall ball and maybe open some small discussion on it so sure. you know having the ability to have a better wall ball system on one side of the court versus the other really does kind of change, you know, which side of the court you start on, because if your game goes to OT, then you're going to want that, that better wall ball for the other court. One thing that teams have done in the past to kind of remove uh, wall ball at all is to have players stand on the back line where they would really just catch anything that goes past the, past the back line. So it doesn't hit the wall. That's illegal. There's a rule in the rule book that's called limited interference or minimal interference. And if the ball has a traject trajectory that's expected to go back into play, you're not allowed to touch that ball. So I think that's something that we need to kind of share to teams at this tournament that you can't really stop wall ball in any way. And kind of moving forward, do you think that wall ball is, you know, the better way to play this game? Or do you think that we should try to inherit some court, some sort of nets everywhere we play i think that it's really it really changes the, the game style whether or not you're playing on a court that has nets versus a court that has wall ball well i think it's easier said than done to incorporate nets in gyms we play in because you know agree. in like elite or usad like you can control where you play the venue right you can get a venue with netting or or long walls versus like some schools just straight up have gyms where wall ball is going to be a thing no matter what like it's kind of unavoidable in that sense and that was a big reason why we adopted the you know fewer than three balls you don't have a shot clock rule was to help mitigate that to some extent to give teams you know more of a shot so that the you know the other team can't just get all 10 balls and sit up on the front line and park the bus so to speak but I, I think that's a lot easier said than done. I would like to change that rule uh, that you mentioned, the minimal interference, maybe at the at a minimum to exclude balls that go out from the back line, something along those lines. I don't know. But um, because I really think we should do what we can to, to mitigate ball, wall ball in general. Yeah, I think wall ball is kind of a, a cancer that's it infected is. this league. I think that the the faster we can do away with it, the better that games are going to be over mm -hmm. time. To yeah. to the outside, you know, who are not, you know, in as deep as, you know, college as well as we are, that's the biggest, you know, gripe they have is the wall ball, the constant throwing off the line and getting all the way back. And, you know, it's it's – the time in between big hits and neutral zone play that we need to eliminate because the most exciting dodgeball happens in the neutral zone yep. and not on the front line, unless, you know, a big catch, you know, or whatever, you know, those happen, but the least amount of that we can have is just the most exciting form of our, you know, style of dodgeball. Yeah. Cause you, to your point, if you have netting or like at the least a long wall, you can get out and transition quicker as the team that that's getting thrown at, right? You don't, otherwise, if you have a short wall, that's five feet or fewer behind the end line, half the time you're worried about turning around and knocking that ball down. So you really can't get up quick in transition. So it slows yeah. the entire game down, just like start to finish. 
Yeah. Um, and... un unless you can keep your team up off the back line for, you know, the majority of the time, but that's easier said than done against some teams. Yeah. So the teams that are going to thrive here at this upcoming OU tournament are definitely going to be the ones that are quick in transition. So we're going to see those teams come out on top and we'll see really who's the best at, at playing wall ball, I suppose. One of the biggest question marks I have is how um, SVSU is going to play because I literally know nothing about their current roster. Um, I've seen BG play. I know GV's GV, so I'm assuming they're going to be, you know, an above average team. Um, OU have heard had some troubles, but I know absolutely nothing about SVSU. They could come out and just completely shock everybody and be one of the best looking teams there. Um, it just really depends on how they prepared. You know, they've had almost an entire you know semester to prepare for this tournament now. Uh, like how how they use their time um, up to this point. Yeah, let's let's use that to transition to the Saginaw tournament that they're hosting in November, November twentieth. Mm -hmm. They're hosting uh, the SBSU tournament. I guess it doesn't have a name yet. Um, Saginaw is present. So is Grand Valley, Michigan State. Bowling Green, Ball State University, and Akron. Well, um, I don't... one second, Dylan. Um, so oh, those there is the last, well, Saginaw will be there. MSU has said they'll be there along with Akron, but I they might limit who they bring, who they invite, because they apparently only have one court. And so only those three teams have said that they'll attend. Saginaw, Michigan State, and Akron, like for sure. So All right. the other three may attend. Interesting. All right. What do you guys think about MSU's team this year? Um, I do know for a fact that they have a pretty big rookie class. I've talked a lot with uh, Rebecca Chappell, uh, who's their co-coach, I think, along with Kevin Wynn. Um, they seem to have a really, really big rookie class who, like, are – it's remarkable. MSU goes on these stretches where they get big rookie class, minuscule rookie class, big rookie class. It's like every other year sort of thing. And apparent per her, these kids are all like starting their own group chats, watching film on their own, like holding each other accountable to show up to practice. So I, I expect as the year goes on, MSU to become a really, really strong team in the in the league. I think they might start out slow just because they're affected just like every other almost every other team was with you know attrition due to COVID. But I think as the year goes on, they I think they'll become very strong. And I wouldn't be surprised if they come out in depending how Saginaw looks and uh, go undefeated at that tournament, potentially. It, it all just depends how they look out the gate. But Yeah, it's going to come down to what the schedule looks like. I mean, honestly, if they play Akron first, they could lose to Akron. But if they have, you know, SVSU, they have a warm-up match. You know, depending on how SVSU looks, they that, that could be a pretty solid match, MSU against Akron. Yep. Or it could be pretty lopsided, depending on how MSU's rookies look. It's this year, it's so exciting because there's such a question mark with so many teams, and it's 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 the most like question mark year that we've ever seen. And play better than we expect, like Penn State. You know that the kind of stuff is so exciting to watch. For sure. I mean, we don't know anything about Saginaw or MSU, so like for all we know, Akron could dumpster both of those teams, right? Like, who knows? Yeah. Um, it, so it, that tournament's a little ways out. It's about three weeks out or two and a half weeks yeah. at this point. So it's, I'm just excited to see dodgeball. I, we skipped over a couple of them, but, um, there's also the pioneer classic on the 13th mm -hmm. and the Cornhusker clash on the 20th, but those look as if it'll be UNL and UWP at both tournaments. SIUE may come to the pioneer classic at this point. It's up in the air as far as, uh, as far as Alexander can report. Um, what do we think of those two teams? We got to give them a couple, little bit of shine here. Uh, I know UWP returns quite a bit. Um, I'm excited to see UWP play. Yeah, I think that they're going to be one of the teams that if if they had more experience throughout the year, if they were a little bit closer to the the central regions, then they could make a lot more noise than we expect. I, uh, Eric Sander, you know, leaked out that UWP might have a B team to these tournaments. And if that's true, then they're going to have a huge rookie class. And that means they're going to develop talent really quick. If they're getting a lot of players to their practices, their teams are their their players are going to develop a lot of skill, you know, really fast, especially with Eric as their coach and leading them through that kind of stuff. Having that uh, alumni experience is going to put them above some other bar, some bar that other teams may not have. So 
if they got out and, you know, had more experience with more teams and just, you know, built up their rookie class, they could, they could make a lot of noise unexpectedly. Yeah. Just to, to chime in, since obviously none of us know that much about like the players in general on that team, the return to play questionnaire that I had each team fill out uh, prior to the season, UWP reported having 17 returners, 10 seniors, six juniors, one sophomore, and Nebraska Lincoln reported having 15 returners, four seniors, and 10 juniors. So, um, I think UWP will, you know, based on those numbers alone, will be the more experienced team coming into this, but I expect both teams to have a pretty good showing, honestly. And I wish UNL was closer so that they could get out to Dylan's point to, to more tournaments, even like to a ball state type tournament or something that's relatively close to them. Yeah. In that region. Yeah. Yeah. In that region, you, uh, UWP has been the top dog for a while, Mm -hmm. but I know pre COVID, um, like UNL was closing in on their talent level and, you know, um, it's going to be really interesting to see how they've, how they've come out of this, you know, pandemic, you know, with as many returners as they do, it's looking like it could be a very, very exciting match or a tournament, um, doubleheader. Um, if SIUE gets thrown in the mix, that's another wrench, but I believe UNL and UWP should have some pretty, pretty good matches, um, with these two tournaments. Mm -hmm. Uh, so moving on, you know, out of the, the predictions for tournaments topic, um, What do you guys think about all American bids or MVPs? Like who who do you guys like so far? I think that it's, it's tough to say, you know, I don't really know any names in the league. If I had to give you an all American list right now, it would be like five guys from UC and, (laughs) you know, a couple of names I know from, from Grand Valley and Akron. I haven't really seen much from any of the other teams. I could probably pick out, you know, a name or two from the East coast, but it's going to be very difficult to see which players stand out. And I think that it's going to be, you know, difficult until we see them all play together in nationals. So it's going to be an interesting all American, all American list this year, but yeah, I know. Go uh, ahead, Colby. It's going to be the most um, like diverse. Um, it looks like it's going to be the most diverse list we've had in a long time um with his like just as many you know east coast as ohio as michigan you know in previous years it's been a michigan dominated you know sometimes you'll have you know a couple east coast or ohio thrown on but it's normally a michigan dominated list and so seeing you know who's playing well this year it's looking like it could be a more diverse list and it's it's great for the league to have more you know uh top tier players and close you know closer in Mm -hmm. skill um, but yeah, as far as names, Jacob Weber from Cincinnati, um, he stole mine. <laughs> uh, I had to, I had to give my boy a shout out, That's you know, fair. former Akron player. He was a, he was our star player when he was there. Um, and he's, you know, one of UC's better guys. Um, uh, Clay Eggleston from Akron had a great showing this past weekend. You know, he, I don't even know if he sweat an entire drop of sweat this entire, that entire weekend. Um, but somebody else from that tournament, uh, Will Frazier from C- CSU had a very good showing, um, a lot of great catches and his, his arms developed pretty well. Um, and as far as other all American, you know, nods or even all Ohio nods, uh, Gabe Carrington and Cole Wilson from BGSU, they held, they held their own and, um, you know, their matches and they were the reason why they won, you know, they had the two and one success, um, that they did. So. Hunter, give me a couple on the East Coast to look out for. A couple of players. Um, yeah. Obviously, so. Jake Corman, I would say, from UVA. I think that he's definitively the best player on the East Coast really? um, overall. Yes. Outside of them, outside of them, uh, with Penn State, Christian Nianizelli, um, he's very, very good. He's their captain. One of the big reasons why they played so well um, thus far. And then additionally, Brady Eck from Penn State has a really, really strong arm. And I think as they continue to develop, they're going to, you know, continue to be elite. Um, from Towson, uh, Hunter Friedman, I would say, is kind of the biggest name with their, with their group. Um, you know, he's a really solid catcher. Definitely fits kind of the traditional all-around mold that you would think from, you know, a high-level player. And then 
Um, additionally, from Maryland, um, Max Zwan, who I mentioned beforehand, um, he's one of the strongest arms that um, not only Maryland has, but has in the league. Um, and I think that he's going to continue to do great things. And then VCU returns uh, Ike Fleckenstein to their team. And obviously he's one of the best, he's traditionally been one of the best catchers in the league for a long time. And um, I think that he will continue to, you know, strive in any situation that he's put in. In the past, oh, go ahead, Dylan. In the past, we've seen, you know, all American lists be pretty much dominated by Michigan players. And I think that this year it's going to be, you know, dominated by Ohio players, in my opinion. I think that the league is kind of taking a turn. And I think that the Ohio region is becoming better than the Michigan region. I don't really think that's a hot take. I think that's just how it is. It's hard to it's hard to have that opinion when I haven't seen much of the Michigan region play. But I think that if I'm guessing all American candidates, I think that a majority of them are going to come from Ohio and, uh, you know, a couple from the East Coast. Obviously, Ben Smart is returning this year. He was the previous MVP. What do you guys think that he has to do to maintain the title? Or do you think it's going to be one that is going to be hard fought? I, I think he's going to have to put GVSU just on his back, like straight up. Um, I, I think it's a long shot for him to win MVP again when his team isn't obviously the clear cut best team in the league, right? Usually the MVP is the best player on the best team uh, for the vast majority of years. And I don't think that's an easy task to, to put on him this year. Uh, I think Barry Butler, the third from Michigan state is someone who's, who was coming into his own. He was right up there with, I think uh, Ryan Ginsburg going at, into COVID as like the two mm -hmm. uh, rookie of the year candidates. So I think Barry is an, an instant MVP candidate. Uh, at MSU, but beyond that, Saginaw and CMU, no idea. Um, so I think those two are a lock, and maybe Tyler Peach from GV to, to mm -hmm. make the All-American list, but beyond that, they might be the only two or three Michigan players on it, unless, but with that said, there's a ton of time for people to make noise. We haven't seen a single Michigan team play yet. Um, yeah. but, but I think it'll be Ohio or Ohio and East Coast teams, prim, you know, taking up the majority of the All-American slots, if I had to guess now. I'm really excited to see Barry play in uh, NCAA matches. The first time I saw him play was in the, um, I forget what city we were in, down in, in Cincinnati, the tournament in Cincinnati, where it was the hybrid uh, between elite and NCAA <clears throat> rules. And it was really interesting to see him play because I hadn't before. And, you know, I, I talked a lot about my own teammate, Ryan Ginsburg, and I thought that he deserved to get rookie of the year that year. And, you know, after seeing Barry Butler play and his, his throwing talent, he really matched up against Ryan and, you know, I thought that he definitely deserved it the way he played there because it was hard to expect after not seeing Michigan state play for, for two years. So seeing how he plays on the court in the NCAA will definitely put him in and, you know, MVP candidate for this year in all American. But, you know, that being said at, to Wes's point earlier, the teams that do have all American players are going to be those teams who are, you know, high in the rankings. So his success is also going to depend on MSU success. So if he and some of their players can help carry them to the top, then he'll definitely have a, a stronger bid for, for that role. Yeah, no, no doubt. It, like I said before, it's just gonna, it'll be a matter of time to see how much, what each of those four Michigan teams look like five, if Western can, can feel the team and get that going again this year, that'll be exciting to see if they can get going. Um, yeah, no, I think that's, we covered all the bases there on the MVP candidates and all American bids. Um, I don't want to toot my own team's horn too much. More, more, than, than, I, more than, than I already are, have. More than you have and more than I've uh, been goaded into doing it myself to piggyback. <laughs> um, let's, let's get some uh, way too early MDC, ODC, East Coast Cup predictions. Uh, I think MDC might be a bit too early to tell, but I'm, I'm, feeling M, uh, MSU and GV are going to be the top two in that region early on, pending what we see from the other teams. But uh, what do, do you guys do think? Do you think now's the time, the year for MSU to break their, their horrible <laughs> MDC streak? If there is a year, it's got to be this one, man. Because we thought it was going to be 16. We thought it was going to be 17, and it, it wasn't. <laughs> and then 18, 19 as well. But Not to throw shade because you were involved no, in a it's... couple of those it's it's cursed man it's it's got to be this year 
I'll, I'll say MSU is going to win OD or MDC. That's a, I like I'm, that take. Yeah, by the way, sounds, I'm going to say MSU as well. Yeah. With having, you know, CMU and SVSU just be two big question marks, you know, mm-hmm. you just look at their, their – yep. It's going to be between GV and MSU. Based on how we know GV is and what we hear about MSU, that's got to be the prediction. And it's going to come down to who's in – the better spot preparation wise at the time. And if, you know, MSU has got the numbers at practice and GV is kind of struggling in that aspect, it, it's, it's, it's not a, you know, it's a good bet to say MSU could be, you know, the top dog in Michigan this year. All right. Let's move on to ODC. I think obviously uh, two teams, in my opinion, to be in the championship are going to be OSU versus UC. I think Akron is definitely making some strides right now, and they could easily contend by the time February February rolls around. But if I had to make a way too early prediction, um, obviously with with UC beating our team early on in the semester, I'd say UC wins ODC. But I will say that you know OSU and, and Akron are going to be coming up on their tail if they keep getting experience and their and their new players develop more talent. Yeah, it's going to come down to what the schedule looks like that day because, like, unlike Michigan, you can't play everybody at the ODC if all the Ohio teams attend. So it's going to mm-hmm. come down to who has the better schedule and, you know, how that play, how that, you know, folds out. Um, it's going to be between Cincinnati and then Akron or Ohio State. Um, Cincinnati's, I'm pretty, I, I'm, I'm putting them, they're going to be in the ODC championship match, but it's going to be Akron or Ohio State. Whoever has the the better position going in and the, the better who shows up that day, um, you know, depending on where even ODC is hosted, that could be a factor. Um, you know, we don't know, uh, you know, what court we're going to be on or where, but, you know, historically it's been, um, you know, ODC teams show up. I mean, ever like, you know, 2019, um, we thought um, Miami was going to run away with it. And it turns out they didn't win. You know, there's they, always a team that shows a championship. up. That's right. It's always yeah. a team that shows up, um, and it's going to be. I think it's going to be a really, really good day at dodgeball. Um, you have three, you know, pretty good Ohio teams, which normally you can't say that you have that many good Ohio teams. Um, what I really want to see is BG get their rookies up to up to par and have a good showing because I saw a lot of promise in that team um, at Akron's tournament last weekend. And I think with the time, you know, that we have to ODC, BG could make a pretty good splash at ODC. Do you think BG, given, you know, the rest of the semester and January, early February could rival Akron? in Ohio it's it's tough because Akron controlled so much of that game um but we were also on our home court we had a tournament going in you know it's gonna be the rookies on BG stepping up and it's gonna come down to who makes the least amount of mistakes and right now that's Akron um their rookies are already leaps and bounds ahead of BG's and they're um their top tier players are uh, ahead of BGs at the moment. And so it's going to come down to if they can close that gap in, in preparation that, you know, that we saw over the weekend. Um, But I think Akron takes it. Um, But BG can definitely turn some heads at ODC and possibly get, you know, a pretty decent upset against Akron if that's, you know, the way the schedule works out. But I think at this juncture, if I had to, you know, if I was a gambling man, like Hunter, I would say that Akron's going to take it um, pretty handily. Okay. Uh, my take is that UC is going to win. So, good take, Wes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm con- contributing a, a lot take. there. No, but I mean, there's a long season to go. It's one tournament that happened three weeks into the year. So, you know, maybe we're not as good as that tournament showed. Maybe we were just the best, most experienced team going into the turn into the season. What do you think know. Cincinnati has to do to keep performing at the level they did? I mean, obviously they performed mm-hmm. like, like, you know, a head yeah. over where Akron and uh, Ohio state were, but where do you think you guys have to stay at or what do you have to work on to keep that pace up, to keep your production where it's at? 
Uh, well, if the university would give us some indoor practice times next semester, that would be really swell because we've been, fun fact, we've played outside uh, almost every single practice this semester on a tennis court. So uh, shout out to UC's uh, rec center for not giving us court space. But no, uh, beyond that, uh, I, I think just keep developing team cohesion. And we do have a few young kids, a few rookies. Um, Ian, Ethan Schlesinger is a kid that I'm really excited on. He's a sophomore, technically. He joined spring of 2020, like January 2021, or whenever we were able to start going outside with the weather. Um, he's got a nasty pump fake. He's a kid that he's a really smart player. He makes all the right plays already. Uh, it, and it's just a matter of time before like the, the results start clicking for him. But it's I think it's just developing the back end a little bit more for us. Um, like you mentioned, we're pretty top heavy with our throwers and whatnot. But, you know, if we can develop that like nine through 12 as to be, you know, closer on par with more of the higher end of the lineup, I think we'll be in really good shape for the, the rest of this year. I think that's where Ohio State needs to to focus on as well because you guys have the top tier talent. It's getting everybody else to catch up. Yeah, and that's something that has definitely came over time. I think that it's it's really hard to judge our team based off of you know our first tournament, which is early September, which is also the first couple weeks of practice. We were really excited to host that tournament because we wanted to get the the ball rolling really for the season in the NCDA. And you know, it's it's really been hard on us not being able to have a tournament in October. There's been a couple of things that uh, OSU has restricted, so we haven't really been able to do anything. But, you know, we're really excited to showcase our talent uh, in a couple of weeks at OU because we've really made leaps and bounds, especially with our rookie class, uh, you know, since that first tournament. Um, I think that three three rookies I can shout out on our team, Ethan Limco, uh, Derek Kemper, Will O'Malley, and uh, he's a sophomore, actually, Elijah Thomas. He's one of our captains this year. He was the only recruit that we got during the off season. I think uh, I said three names, but I ended up with four. Yeah. Um, I think that they are all just outstanding players. They're just those, those people that, you know, come into the game and just are naturally athletic. They naturally get all the strategy and, you know, given more play time, they're going to become something that's going to be the foundation for this team in the future. And it's really exciting to see them grow over the past couple of months. And um, they're going to be kind of holding our team up, uh, this uh, in a couple of weeks at OU. So I think that they're also really early candidates for the, the all rookie list. It's going to be hard to, you know, compare talent with them in my opinion, but I also say that without knowing any of the other rookies in the league. So biased opinion there. Yeah. All right. We are uh, to save some time here, moving on East coast cup predictions. I'm going to go first uh, and then I'll give it over to Hunter. But my bold take is, Penn State will win the East Coast Cup. And based I'm solely basing that off the results of their last tournament. <laughs> so, Hunter, what do you think? Your more uh, nuanced opinion here. Who do you think in February looks the best? Well, I don't know about nuance, but uh, Ed Orderon once said, go Tigers. So I'm going to say go Tigers. <laughs> All right. Well, he's picking Towson. What do you guys think? <laughs> I think it's I've hard also... not to pick Towson. <laughs> it, is. it is hard Go not ahead. to pick Towson. That's true. I think that given their experience in the past, by the time February rolls around, uh, we're not going to see the, the gap between them and, and Penn State that we do right now. I think that we're going to see, or I'm sorry, the small gap between them. I think that gap is just going to increase over time and they're going to become the team that they have been in the past. So if, if uh, the East Coast Cup was, was coming up here shortly, I would say Penn State has a chance, but for it to be, you know, in the spring semester, in the middle of the year, uh, I think Towson is going to run away with it. Colby? Um, I, I I would love to say Penn State, um, but I do think it's going to be Towson. Uh, like Dylan said, it's they just have more time to get more cohesive and to have a better strategy than they already do. Um, they have the benefit of coaching, which – goes a long way um if penn state's gonna have a chance at winning they're gonna have to develop some sort of strategy um you know some better strategy than they do now you know they can't just rely on athletic ability and making great plays it has to be an entire team effort i don't think they have 
the they don't have what Towson has right now, and Towson is going to come back to being um, the best team in the East, you know, by a, by a decent margin by that time. Well, nobody's shown JMU any love. Uh, shout out Drew Funk. Um, but <laughs> no, I mean, I, I do agree. I think Towson's the, the easy pick to make here. And, you know, if I wasn't trying to be a hot take artist, I'd probably be taking them as well. But uh, Coley makes a good point. PSU's young, inexperienced, uh, talented, but uh, hopefully they can continue. They can keep, they're going to keep playing a lot of games like this. They'll be in good shape. I think they're due to play their seventh match, uh, this weekend. So I think, I think that just that sheer game experience and hopefully getting some footage and, uh, you know, dissecting that and really critically analyzing that'll go a long way to them developing into the spring. So, uh, I think them playing four matches in their first tournament was an big. incredible move. Because you, you're going to play fatigue to nationals, you know, you're going to play, you know, that large amount of matches and getting that out of the way and, you know, seeing where they were at, just like getting thrown in was super good move on their part. Yeah. No, nah, someone had to stand up, step up to it. And I'm glad they were the ones that did it. Um, Res- mad respect. Yeah. All right. Uh, do we, do we want to go into a nationals uh, final four real quick? Absolutely not. We've got, we, we've got a long time till then. I don't even want to think about it. I want to um, enjoy everything else that comes before it. All right, I fine. Think prediction is UC, OSU, Akron, BGSU. In the final yeah, four. What a, what a, yeah. what a homer. In, in the Nationals final four. That's my prediction. No, nah, he just wants four Ohio teams because he's uh, used to it being four Michigan teams. <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna say, say – I'm going to say <laughs> it's going to be um, Cincinnati – Akron, uh, GVSU, and then the fourth spot is up for grabs. Um, I think where some like where you're going to have a top tier team lose out is getting a shitty part of the bracket. We've seen it happen before, um, like a shitty side. You know, whoever has to play UC on day two and you know have to compete with their their ability to not get winded. You know, Nationals is a long ass day. And the teams that have the most conditioning are going to be the ones who, you know, do do well. And the deep rosters is going to do on that day. That fourth spot, it could be ta- it could be um, OSU, or you know, it could be you know a team that you know can, um, you know, if they put it together like Penn State or JMU by that time. But it's going to be a really, really, you know, really good national. It's probably the best you know, we've seen in a while when it comes to how close the competition is. Parity, yeah. I think six teams that are really going to make it difficult to, to judge or, um, you know, difficult to pick four out of the six are definitely Grand Valley and MSU from the Michigan region, and then UC, OSU, honestly, Akron included, and then Towson and... Um, JMU. Yeah. I think that those those teams are going to make it difficult to, to figure out who's going to be in the final four, and we'll see that come out once we enter the spring semester. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, for my picks, I think I'm going to be a bit of a homer here and pick uh, UC, Michigan State, um, Towson, much to my, you know, chagrin about my East Coast Cup pick there from PSU, but – <laughs> and then rounding and then rounding it out, I'm not, it's a toss up for me right now. I think it'll be either uh, OSU or James Madison as the fourth team. So nice. Sorry, it, it's gonna and it's gonna be. I don't TV. care. It's <laughs> gonna be wild to to not you know if we don't see a GV you know national yeah. you know title appearance, it's gonna be wild. Um, mm-hmm. I'm most excited to see new teams in the final four um, than we have before. Um, you know, COVID, you know, it's yeah. been historically the same teams and getting to a point where we are now in the league where it's the competition's closer and it's different teams stepping up. It's going to be really exciting come nationals. And I'm, I'm really excited for day, day one to see the different matchups, but day two to see where it all shakes out. Yeah. I oh, I, I meant to mention this earlier when we were talking about the John Butters cup or tournament. Uh, fun fact about Grand Valley, the last time they've lost to an Ohio school, I think was Ohio State in like 2006. So um, That's awesome. yeah, fun fact there. They've been pretty dominant against Ohio schools since then. 
Um, mm. So if UC were to beat them or, or Ohio, I think they play Ohio too, that would be a pretty big upset on the, on the scale, much less for GV to not make the final four at nationals. I don't know that that's ever happened since they've been a team. Yeah, I know OSU won the national t national championship in, in 2006. Yep. And I'm pretty sure either Saginaw or Grand Valley won the next year in 2007. Anybody Grand Valley won four there? in a row at that point after that. Okay, that's then, that's what I thought. Yep, then Central, then Saginaw, then Grand Valley for a million more in a row, and then Towson. Yeah. Oh, Saginaw only has one title? For some reason, yep. I thought they had three. No, they have one. Interesting. Mm -hmm. But uh, – so, Hunter, if you don't want to give picks, I guess that rounds it off for us. Uh, real quick before we sign off, plug in again. Uh, we are changing the name of the podcast. We're rebranding. If you have any suggestions and you're still listening at this point, uh, please send them to the eboard or, you know, in the Captain's Club or something like that. Um, or, if, or any logo designs because we're yep. in the new logo, too. If you're good at graphic design, you know, we'll take suggestions for that as well. Yeah. Or if you just have any suggestions at all, or if you just want to, you know, pop in and say hi and ask how we're doing, that's also very welcome. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> Start thinking right. about rule proposals. It comes up quick and people try to submit them too late or, you know, we get too many, you know, at one time. Think, start thinking about things, you know, read the rule book, take the rule book quiz. You know, we worked... Plug. You know, oh, we didn't plug the rule book quiz yet. No, oh take God. the rule book quiz. You know, it it it's it does help. I don't know how many of you read the rule book, you know, more than once or one time at all, but please have your teams take it. It's better for the league as a whole if we have better officials and more knowledgeable players. Yep, that's absolutely true. Uh despite that coming across as old men yet old men yelling at the clouds, but um <laughs> but yeah, no. Again, please take the rule book quiz. It is very important. It'll help, you know, improve our game overall tremendously. So to sign off really quick, uh, out of UC, I'm Wes Peters. Out of Akron, I'm Colby Priceland. Out of OSU, I am Dylan Greer. Out of Richmond, Virginia, President Hunter Ford. See you guys. Good job, guys. That went probably 45 minutes too long. <laughs>